happy and thrilled to introduce Voices in Sustainability. This is our series one, and my name is Tanya. My name is Caroline. And welcome to our first series of Voices in Sustainability, which is focused on sustainability on a budget for today's series. As expected, our special guest speaker for today is Isaiah Hernandez. Before we get started, let's get to know Isaiah Hernandez a little better. Isaiah Hernandez is an environmental educator and creator of Queer Brown Vegan, where he creates introductory forms of environmentalism through colorful graphics, illustrations, and videos. He seeks to provide a safe space for like-minded environmentalists to advance the discourse around the climate crisis. Today, Isaiah will be discussing how to be sustainable on a budget. And then it will be followed with a Q&A where you have the opportunity to ask Isaiah any questions you might have. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen at any point of the presentation, and they will be answered at the end. There is a live transcript as well available down below. You, you just have to click on show subtitle and it should work. So without further ado, we will hand it over to Isaiah Hernandez. Yeah, thank you so much again, everyone, for having me today. I'm really excited um, to get this started. I'm just going to share my screen and then start the present button. Um, but it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you all, especially from CSUN. Um, I actually, that was the first college I was I got into when I was in high school. And my brother did go to CSUN. I grew up in the Valley. So um, I'm really, I live nearby Northridge, actually, where my sister grew up. Well, my sister lives in Canoga Park. but. Um, I actually was living there a few months ago, and so I moved back to the East Coast. Um, but today's topic we're going to be discussing is about trying to be eco-friendly or sustainable. I think that there's just so many ways that we can approach sustainability, especially within our own lifestyles. And so I really want to take this space uh, for you all to kind of hopefully take away some key messaging of how we see sustainability um, through a conceptual theoretical lens, but also through a lifestyle lens and how um, you know, eco-friendly lifestyles look so different for a lot of us. And so um, this hopefully encourages you all to kind of feel motivated or inspired to reduce some parts of your uh, of waste at your home or trying out new things that you may have not experienced. Um, yeah, and just a little bit about me. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. I grew up um, in Silmar and would spend a lot of my time in Pacoima. And I think for me, I've realized like the environmental injustice in my area Especially, I grew up taking the metro to school. I lived in affordable Section 8 housing my whole life. And so trying to really navigate the environmental spaces, especially in the Valley, was a bit confusing for me, mainly because I didn't really know how to ask questions. And so that really led me to get uh, my major in environmental science at UC Berkeley. And so for me, that was really a, a, a pivoting moment um, to really think about what I wanted to do in life. And so. I'm a full-time freelance environmental educator and content creator or influencer, you can say, online. Um, and so I'm really thankful to be here today. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, pop them in at the end of the chat. But um, we're going to get into this presentation. So one of the first things that I ask people, especially you all, is like, what is sustainability, right? And so I think for me, when I first learned about sustainability in college, I thought, oh, it's about be using a bamboo toothbrush or whatever, you know? And so although I heard it through an academic lens of like sustainable solutions or like, a, you know, this is not sustainable in the math equation, I realized that sustainability is much more uh, connected to cultural, spiritual and religious practices. And so when I think about sustainability, I think of it as a practice or a tradition of creating a circular lifestyle that does not impact animal species, communities of color, um, and ecosystems. And I think it's rooted in traditional ancestral knowledge, which is Black Indigenous people of color that have always been cultivated different types of practices um, that protected the earth and the soil in their communities. And so um, kind of to think about sustainability, this is how I defined it. And this image actually was um, drawn by one of my friends as a designer that really loved the work. And so she took sustainability and really saw, drew these very beautiful images of what, you know, represented a sustainability, like what different people look like. And so a lot of times we hear the phrase of environmentalism is a white thing. And so what I really wanted to do is to showcase that people that it's very uh, ancestral root and it's a lot of us carry intrinsic relationships, everyone carries intrinsic relationships to the earth. And so 
um, sustainability for me is much more deeper than just the standard definition of like trying to sustain something. Um, so that has been kind of like my belief system uh, when working with these types of systems. But um, in reality, a lot of people ask me, okay, well, what, how do you communicate sustainability? And so I think that from an environmental educator standpoint, I really love the fact of using visual imagery and colors to demonstrate that and to break down each topic. And so here's like kind of some screenshots of my work that I've done previously um, within sustainable topics. And I think that so many of us have so many questions in the environmental space. And so what I felt really important is that we take the time to distill each question and to have these open dialogues online because most of the times when I was in college just three years ago, I remember um, feeling embarrassed to ask questions about certain topics or areas. And so um, for me, I guess I took this online as a way to become an educator with no teaching degree, but an environmental science degree to kind of help me understand how I want to communicate science that is more accessible, but also make environmentalism more fun for people because I think a lot of us sometimes stretch you know, that's not our major, or that's not really our specific focus. And so um, that is something kind of I, I kind of wanted to like emphasize for people. And so a lot of people ask me, you know, how did you grow up living sustainably? And so I want you all to take like a few 10 seconds to think what you did that was sustainable. Um, I think for me growing up in Los Angeles, like, I realized like, my parent, like my I grew up low income my whole life. And I remember like, a lot of the things that we did that were not really seen as sustainable, but were seen as a poor thing or seen as like a low income thing was reusing the jars you had for like salsa or, you know, going to your local swap meet or, you know, flea, I think they call them flea market, but I would call them swap meet here in Pacoima where I went. And that was something that was very memorable to me because this is where I was supporting local economies, my community, where you're able to buy stuff that you don't really see typically in the mall. I really never went to the mall growing up and um, kind of like plastic trash bags on there. So um, that was kind of something that I found sustainable growing up, but I saw it as like, this is just survival. So if you have to take some time to think about what your family did, or if you want to share um, if how you grew up sustainable, feel free to do so because I kind of laugh when I see like the little, like the meme on the left of like growing up Hispanic because that was something that was a reality for me. So do you definitely look back into what you've done in the past. And so a lot of people generally ask me, um, you know, is living eco-friendly expensive? And that is like one of the hardest things sometimes to discuss. I think realistically, like we've been ingrained that like we have to buy ourselves into these green products to become what you would say a better environmentalist. But in reality, like I, as a low income, low income individual, I grew up in LA. I was like, I don't have access to farmers markets or energy clean cars or bulk refill store in my area. Like that was not a thing that did not exist. Maybe the Metro in LA, but like that was, like everyone took it or if you did if you did have if you didn't have a car um then you didn't have to take it but I always took it and I was I hated the metro because it was always late I was always getting late to school um but the reality is that like you know eco-friendly lifestyles have been practiced for so long and I think that uh when we try to portray it as like oh you need to buy these products um we're not really doing the justice that is needed and so I think trying our best to live sustainably even if that means buying products sometimes we should not shame ourselves but rather to examine how um, certain green products can cost more um, or also can last you longer but I think that I often found myself buying eco-friendly products when I was growing up um, I guess like two years ago when I started to live more sustainably is that in college I didn't really think about it in college I was working a lot of part-time jobs I didn't really think about buying an eco-friendly thing because I was like, I'm broke. I don't have money. I just paid rent or I just don't have enough money. I have only $50 to last for this for the next two weeks until, you know, payroll kicks in for bi-weekly payments. And so that I found myself more and more disconnected thinking that living sustainably is kind of impossible. But I realized that a lot of the things I did was already sustainable. Like 
in college, I didn't have a car. I just walked everywhere. In college, like I had a reusable water uh, bottle. And that was something that was a very privilege for me to have. But um, definitely, I think that, you know, when you ask yourself this question, like, um, do you think living eco-friendly is expensive? Because I think for me, there's this, yeah, like there's this like notion that it that it is, but in reality, I think we have to look at it both sides. Like, yes, it seems expensive trying to buy into this lifestyle, but at the same time, a lot of our culture is already sustainable. So it's not like you have to, you're having to give that up or saying that you were culture or your people were never sustainable. Um, so that's one thing I kind of wanted to emphasize on. Um, one of the things I did want to like, talk about is like the five R's to eco-friendly, uh, eco-friendly to live eco-friendly. Um, the, I kind of created this like framework or rules that I follow because I saw the other ones and they don't, I don't know, I didn't really connect to them. And so um, the first one I kind of introduced is reconnecting. I think before you even try to go eco-friendly lifestyle or buy products, asking yourself to connect back with your cultural roots your own lived experiences of what your family, siblings, or loved ones did that made them sustainable. Because most often not, when you look back at your culture or your own lived experiences of what your parents would do uh, or say to you or scold you, is that it was really actually eco-friendly. Like I didn't realize that. And then number two is researching, right? I think a lot of us see these products and we're like, oh my God, they're like sustainable. Like we need to get them. But then really ask yourself, like, what are these products made out of? Like, where, where are they sourcing it? Like, are they being transparent? Because most of the times um, when I worked at a zero waste store, um, other brands would try to reach out to us. And so a lot of the times, if it's ambiguous saying like, oh, we make this in uh, a different country, we make it in Brazil, we make it in Mexico. But then you're like, okay, but where in Mexico? Like where, what location, what region, like who is getting paid? Um, number three is reevaluating. So like before you even buy the product and after your research and you're like, okay, like I want to get it, ask yourself if you really need to buy that product because, or continue purchasing the exact product you have always, even if it's plastic, because something that I, I realized about reevaluating is that a lot of us are usually follow the crowd sometimes. And so it's so important that like, we actually like take the time to, um, understand ourselves to say like what is it that do we really need this is it the end of the day if I don't get it like no um, and so that is something another thing I really want to emphasize on number four is redesigning right don't stop your advocacy and just purchasing products right what are the other issues you can get involved in and as an environmental educator one of my main values is environmental justice and so for me I always tell people I want you to extend yourself longer than having this passion for products to recognize the injustice in many of these systems that produce oppression for many communities of color. And so, you know, what are the is other issues you can get involved in? And some kind of great examples of this is, you know, some people are interested in beauty. Okay, like what's wrong with the beauty industry? Like from a standpoint of there's a lot of human trafficking, slavery that goes into mining these resources for the beauty cosmetic industry. If you're looking at the fashion industry, right? You have a passion for clothing, thrifting. Well, what about garment workers in LA or people from the global south that have to work at these factories and getting less paid than less than a dollar a day? How do we, it costs zero dollars here in the West for us to really advocate for human rights and the well being of people. Um, and number five is reestablishing, right? After you kind of redesign your relationship, saying like, okay, I'm into fashion, I love thrifting, I want people to become more knowledgeable in thrifting, I'm gonna also advocate for human rights because fast fashion sucks. And so when you reestablish, you, wanna, you then wanna create that local change, you educate yourself and others around you to do more than buying products, right? And some of this can look easily from saying like, hey, hey Tanya, like I really don't think you should go to Forever 21, like let's not go there, let's go actually thrifting or let's actually think about you know let's protect these garment workers in LA like there's protests happening let's share it on social media even if we can't go there physically you know so there's something there's a lot of things like that that I really uh, want people to kind of take away from that and um, I guess the next section is I kind of wanted to introduce this what is sustainable series so for me I've actually had such a huge passion so in the chat I'm going to give you all 10 seconds in the chat to think okay what do you think is more sustainable? 
a plastic bag, brown paper bag, or a cotton tote bag. Um, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm really, I'm generally cur curious about everyone's thoughts. Uh, let me see, there's more. Cotton tote bag, cotton tote bag, cotton tote. Yeah, it's very interesting, cotton, cotton tote bag. Yeah, so it seems like everyone is agreeing on the cotton tote bag being the most sustainable option. Uh, we have one for plastic. Uh, oh, Alex said plastic. No one has said brown paper bags, which is interesting. So, um, okay, so I really don't want people to feel like weirded out by this, an this answer, but um, in reality, it is complicated to assess. So um, a life cycle assessment is basically used a lot in industries to, to, to measure the impact through different categories, one being like carbon um, dioxide, um, raw material consumption, like what is needed, um, pollution by the ozone layers. They measure all of these different categories. And so in the life cycle assessment, the plastic bat is the much more sustainable one to use. But that's if considering society uses reuses a plastic bag a hundred and plus times within that going, which in reality, I think most people use plastic bags up to one to five times on average. So what, what the study was saying is that it's not saying that, yes, you go for plastic. It's just saying that if we are living in a society that is very conscious by design to think about how to reuse plastic bags, yes, it would be the more sustainable option. But in reality, with cotton tote bags, another thing to consider is that they don't, they don't, they're harmful to the landfills when they're sent directly. They consume a lot of water and it's very intensive to grow cotton. But the, is, the thing is, is that when you look at the brown paper bag too, um, it's, it goes through a very harmful process to, well, I actually put the brown paper bag, I should put the cotton tote bag. But anyways, um, in the brown paper bag, it uses a lot of harmful chemicals from wood pulp to manufacture it. And many of these like facilities actually pollute the waters nearby. And so this is kind of a reality that brown paper bags actually aren't the best, but they are reuse more often than plastic bags, right? And so I think for me, when I think about sustainability, I also think, look back into looking, okay, what is the most natural process compared to the three? And I would have to say the, the cotton tote bag is much more natural for me and much more organic, mainly because it uses, doesn't use fossil fuels, it doesn't use plastic, it doesn't use these other materials, it uses organic materials like cotton, you use in the soil. Um, it uses water, of course, which is a natural resource. And so dyeing the cotton tote bag isn't harmful, actually, if done properly. So in reality, it's, I think that like, it's such a huge issue in sustainability when people are like, choose a tote bag, like it's the best because it can be reused. But in reality, like who, like, when we look at these diagrams, and we look about the pollution and the process of it's made, um, the LCA does show that plastic bags are better. So that is something that I did want to share with you all. I actually have another series um, right now to tell you all. Okay, so next series we're going to do before we kind of get into this eco-friendly living stuff is what do you think is more sustainable, digital ebook or physical book? Ebook. Digital ebook. Yep. So I think so I think we have a ebook on, on here. A lot of people are very interested in that. No shipping or printing. Yes. So for me, let's talk about the characteristics. So a lot of physical books, right? I love to hold physical books. Like I actually have one right here. I love physical books because for me, I like to hold them in my hand. For my brother, he likes digital books. And I'm like, I don't, I don't see the point of getting a digital book. But I realize that it does reduce the amount of books that you have at home. Because at the end of the day, when you read a book, most often not, you're not going to reread that book again. Or if you are, it's for research purposes or 
I don't know, you're letting it borrow a friend or you're giving it, or you're just trying to reread it again or see another chapter. So again, like this is kind of like a very confusing question because there's, I don't think there's such a one ended answer to being like, this is the most sustainable option. But fun fact, it does take around a hundred physical books to equal the emissions as just one e-reader. On average, each physical book releases around, you know, eight and a half pounds of carbon dioxide. With e-readers, it depends on the manufacturer, but it depends on how you want to see it, right? Because what really, what we, when we think about what is the most organic option, kind of like, you know, the tote bag or the plastic bag, which is more natural to produce? Clearly the tote bag, because plastic is not natural. Plastic is, uses uh, fossil fuels. A lot of the digital e-readers require rare minerals to make, like the batteries, the technology, the technology behind it, and there's a lot of issues with mining, mainly because it's not a renewable resource. Mining for batteries like, you know, lithium, emerald, all of these other, uh, you know, minerals that, are, that exist in these mines, many countries in the global south are exploited for them. And so it's really concerning to say that, um, yes, I understand the statement of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but in reality, let's like, let's actually think like, okay, so, if you had, if you're an avid reader, though, would you want to choose the digital ebook or the physical book, right? Because physical books already exist so much. We have a large surplus of books that are existent. And so this isn't to shame the author saying that they should not produce a book because I'm actually writing a book too. <laughs> so, but on that end, like, I think that um, we should choose the option that's much more sustainable and accessible for us because I don't think that, um, you know, books themselves really are the huge issue, but we do need to be conscious of how we're kind of producing these paper books and also these digital e-readers. But I think digital e-readers do last long. I think they last around eight or even like five to 10 plus years from what I've heard from people. So I think definitely when we look at it, we, it's really confusing, but um, I really, I really think that I would go with the physical book only because I think it's more natural to produce it through an environmental setting rather than an e-reader. But it can be argued, you know, wood and paper, you know, talking about that industry too, that it does consume a lot. Okay, so the next one is really funny. So, okay, what's more sustainable, do you think? Like a charcoal filter or a Brita water filter? Um, I know this has been a huge issue because like not everyone has, has access to clean water. So I'm gonna give you all like 10 seconds to think about that or 15. Yeah, a lot of people are asking about charcoal. The Brita filter has plus charcoal biodegradable. <laughs> is this a trick question? Um, great, yeah, a lot of people saying charcoal and Brita. So yeah, so I guess like charcoal water filters are traditionally used in different areas outside of the West in different, a lot of regions. And Brita water filters were kind of introduced, I think in the 90s or 2000s or late 2000s, like this brand Brita, uh, because I didn't see it exist back then. But so let's talk about it. So. Um, Brita, you know, states that it has the potential to save 1,800 water bottles per year. However, most filters are made out of plastic, which is correct, which someone said. And they can only be recycled directly with TerraCycle, which is a recycling company. And that's not even accessible for some people, but apparently a TerraCycle has a free program. So if you have five or six of these filters, you can get like a free coupon to send them over to get them properly recycled. Um, charcoal water filters come from indigenous uh, communities primarily, and so it's not it's not that that it's not that one is better for the environment. I would say yes, charcoal water filter is much more sustainable, but both of these um, equipments they don't what you would say clean or purify water completely. Um, it's nearly impossible for any device to give you hundred percent clean clean water. Because when we look at the Brita, the Brita is advertising that it gets rid of like certain things. The charcoal filter 
as is drinkable, of course, too, when you put it in, but some people are skeptical about it. And this is because like, there's so much things in our waterway systems that we don't know, like microplastics entering them. So it's really, I think, important that we kind of make the differentiation that um, I know some people use a Brita plus a charcoal water filter. Like I have a, char I have a, I have both charcoal filter and a Brita water filter. And so there's no specific one that cleans water that gives you 100% clean water. Like that just does not exist, unfortunately. Uh, but when you look back into history, when charcoal, uh, maybe boiling is a better option. Um, the thing is with boiling, I think that it requires a lar large amount of gas being used. So that would be very uh, concerning for some people, especially those in areas that may not have the best ventilation systems. But I think that with charcoal filters, um, they were used historically because um, they were able to be grown in that area. And a lot of them come from, you know, volcanoes or nearby volcanoes. And so uh, Kishu is one of the brands, I think, that I use for charcoal water filters. Some of them do come in plastic packaging. So it's like kind of like, I guess like the same thing as a Brita water filter. Um, but yeah, I guess like for me, I've had really big issues with, um, you know, the Brita because I think that a lot of people always think it gives you like 100% clean water, which that does not exist in any system. So um, there's only certain amounts it, it like cleans it. So just a, just a note about that. Um, but I'm gonna give a whole breakdown soon, but I kind of first wanted to cover free eco tips for students because I realized that when someone tried telling me to live eco-friendly, I was like, I'm broke, I don't have any money. Like, what do you want me to do? And then I realized how much like easy things there are that exist that you can do. So one of the first steps I recommend is regrowing your vegetables, like getting vegetable scraps and putting them in a jar. Even if you live in an apartment, you can grow them in glass jars. So I generally grow green onion in my house. Um, it's really easy to grow. All you have to do is just put a little bit of water in your glass cup and then insert them and they grow within a week and two. And then you can always like cut them and then have more. So it's really easy to just regrow those vegetables. Um, number two is that I know a lot of us um, kind of like don't really, or maybe have not tried that much plant-based milks, but oat milk is very easy to make. Oats are the cheapest out of any seeds or nuts that exist because almonds, walnuts, cashews, like they cost a ton. And I would never want someone that is trying to live sustainably on a budget to buy those because they're just expensive. And so oats are much more cheaper and accessible for a lot of people. Like you can get like a bag worth of them for like five bucks or like, I don't know, 10 bucks. And it's like, it's worth it. So with oat milk, it's really easy to make. I do have a recipe online that you can like look it up too, but it's very easy. All you have to do is basically add a few cups of water, oats, uh, vanilla, and then pink or pink, pink salt, basically. And then you just blend it. And then you can use a cloth or a strainer to get the milk out. So it's really easy to do that. Um, the other thing is like upcycling your plastic bottles to containers, which I don't think that some people have done. I actually did it in college once. I think my freshman year or sophomore year in the dorm. Um, and so it was really easy because I grew little plants in there. Like I grew succulents in there. And so I know a lot of us, you know, sometimes we can look at it and we're like, it's not that, you know, good looking in the room or it's like ugly. I, it's really helpful, honestly, because you get to like, it's really accessible and like you don't need to spend money on buying, you know, plots. Um, and then I think clothing scraps to kitchen towels is so useful. Like I grew up where my parents would just basically um, rip up and like cut my tea, old t-shirts and then we'd use them for cleaning. And so um, you can also use them for kitchen towels because yeah, like who wouldn't want to use them? And then reusable bags, of course, is, you know, number one thing that I think a lot of people preach. And then um, reusable water bottles, right? So with reusable water bottles, I feel like not everyone has access to clean water. And so that's why I'm like, you know, just yes, do have one if you can, but like, yes, use a Brita or a charcoal filter if you need to, to also help that out. Um, and then also walk, bus, or bike around. Cause I know in CSUN, I think it's a, you can, I don't think you, I don't know. My brother would take the car to CSUN uh, cause we live cities away. But for me, I think that you, if you live nearby in the area, definitely 
walk around or bus or bike around if it's safe for you. Um, and then number eight is like start an environmental club or project. I think a lot of people um, are always thinking like, oh, I need so much money to do things I want. But in reality, what if you just want to create something that you're just passionate about? Like I know so many people, especially college students right now that are like, I'm passionate about this subject. I want to create something. I'm like, what has stopped you? Or like, why haven't you done it? Like no one's stopping you. No one's saying no to you. So uh, definitely do create that. So um, that is one thing. Um, another thing is zero waste stores. So zero waste stores have become so popular in LA and like New York and different states. And so I wanted to give a few suggestions for people that um, want to know like what zero waste store they can visit. This is, I think, a best introduction for certain people to go to look into the refill options because um, a lot of us sometimes just buy new products like you know body wash, shampoo, conditioner, um, other things. And so the first store on the left is Sustain LA. I think this is more near the beach area, uh, Monte Vista. Um, I think, I haven't been there though, but this is actually a really great store. They sell a lot of refill things. Another thing, I, I don't know if you heard of the name, but it was called Tear Grocery in LA. It's actually near, it's a little bit far from Northridge. I think a 20, 20 minute drive or 15 minute drive from Northridge. Um, and so basically here they sell everything in bulk. So you can literally get anything that you want, zero waste and plastic free. All you, and you bring your own jars and they help you measure it. So I uh, really recommend this one. And on the right one, I think this is a newer one. It's actually nearby Canoga Park and nearby Northridge. So I would say the right one's the most closest. Um, but Pro, Pro Sustainable is another refill shop that um, sells a lot of plastic free and zero waste products. So I do recommend that um, you do check them out just for fun if you really want to see them because a lot of times I when I go into them it, they look really pretty and I'm like I want to work here or I want to live here um, but I don't know feel free to share your thoughts if you've ever visited Zero Waste Store because I actually used to work for one so um, I worked one in New York so during the time I lived in Brooklyn. Just gonna move this here. Um, let's see. Cool. Um, awesome. So, some eco-friendly tips. So, a lot of people always ask me, like, what what product should I try out? Like, what do I do, Isaiah? I don't know what I'm doing. And so, I think for me, um, let's start out first with the bathroom. So, when I I say when I when I say I'm zero waste or like low waste, whatever, I'm saying that as possible as I can because realistically there's I think it's impossible to live plastic free in a world that like gives you plastic no matter where you go but I think the easiest way to reduce your waste as an eco-friendly enthusiast is do your bathroom first the bathroom is the most easiest because you don't need to stress yourself out about it so with bamboo toilet paper right we use around 57 sheets per day um, and that's really consuming for us. And fun fact, Charmin, the, to the toilet paper, is sometimes known to clog toilets uh, from other plumbers that, I have, that have messaged me about it, which is pretty funny. Um, and so brands like um, Real, Real Paper, Plant Paper, Who Gives a Crap, these brands um, all sell paper, uh, bamboo toilet paper that are FSC certified, which means that they are verified and where they come from. I think they come in from China, FSC. So they're verified through a third party organization. Um, they are costly if you are sharing it with, like if you have a family, you're sharing it with your loved ones or friends. So for me, I bought them with my partner only because they're really easy. We don't really use that much. And so it's, really not a huge issue. It does cost a little bit more. I would say maybe like $2 for a roll maybe. So that is something to really consider as students, what you wanna try. Um, oh, I see some comments actually, just let me read that. Oh, what about bidets? Yes. So bidets, I didn't include them on here only because bidets generally cost much more than these products that sell for. I know bidets have been used historically in many cultures. Uh, they're, they're becoming popular here in the West, but I think a lot of people don't want it. Another thing I, I will say that is, I don't think I'd ever use is 
unpapered toilet paper, so reusable toilet paper that's made out of cloth. And so apparently, like, I don't know how it works, but basically you use it and then you wash it. I would never use, use it myself, but, you know, I support people if they do, I guess it's just not for me. But um, the other thing is like a bamboo toothbrush, right? We throw away like 300 toothbrushes in our lifetime. And I use uh, brands like Brush With Bamboo, they're POC owned, or Rite Aid sells any types of bamboo toothbrushes. And I use them because um, they're compostable. Um, the only thing you do need to remove out of the toothbrushes are the, the strips that are on there, like the white things where you brush your teeth because those are made of nylon. And so they're not, you know, you would say like you have to get rid of them correctly before the, the, wooded, the wood stick is uh, take, disposed of properly. So just think about that. In my opinion, bamboo toothbrushes should cost around like, I think one to $4 uh, realistically. So that is something that I do recommend. It is soft bristle. So if you're someone that uses like hard bristle toothbrushes, you know, maybe not be the best. Another thing to add is that electric toothbrushes or plastic toothbrushes with the removable heads. And a study was found that removable heads that are made of plastic are actually much more sustainable environmentally because you're just getting rid of that top part. But again, it's like when we go back to like measuring like what is the most organic way, like we have to think about that. I know in different cultures too, they use, I think certain picks or like a tree or a bark or something to chew on. So that is also a very indigenous practice that a lot of people would do to clean their teeth or to like take care of their teeth. Um, another thing on the right side is shampoo and conditioner bar. So I added brands like Unwrapped Life, um, let me see if this is going to move. Sorry about that. Um, yes. High Bar, Earthling Co, Viore Beauty. The reason why shampoo bars don't work for so many people is because they are not always the best for people who have curly hair. And so there are some that are Black-owned businesses that have focused on curly hair products because that has been a huge issue for a lot of my friends themselves. And so for me, shampoo and conditioner bars are actually really easy to use. Um, it depends on how you use it because a lot of times I have friends that are like, I don't like it. I, I use them, uh, but I also have the bottle ones too, just in case in metal, uh, just in case they don't want to use it. But definitely they do cost a little bit more than shampoo bottles and average plastic ones cost around like, I don't know, two to five bucks. Shampoo bar costs like a 12 bucks and then the conditioner is like another 12. So it's like you're spending around 20 bucks already to um, spend on this product, but it comes plastic free. So you should consider that if you do want to make the investment. I know that um, sometimes companies offer samples. So I would definitely look into that and see um, if there are options there. When it comes to your cleaning and laundry purposes, um, I use a reusable sw Swedish dish cloth, like brands like Three Bluebirds, Koi Cloth, Super Scandi, uh, DI Swedish dish cloth. One of these can replace 17 rolls of, of paper towels because they're able to be used multiple times. I think it's up to 90 times. And so they dry out really easily. Um, they don't, they absorb the water and then like you can like, basically it's like a towel. So it's like you, uh, release the water and then it dries out. So they're really easy to use to clean. Um, so I really like them rather than using paper towels to clean. The other thing is laundry strips. So I grew up using like, I don't know, that one popular laundry detergent company. I don't remember, Tide, I think Tide. So a lot of the detergents that we have have large amounts of water liquid. So basically, you get less detergent, like the chemical, like the soap is really less. And it's generally just basically water that you're getting. So laundry strips actually are a new product that basically it's like a tab of paper and you put it in and it dries your clothes. And so I use them because they're vegan, in my opinion. Um, I know some people use wool balls, basically they're made out of wool. So you insert them in because a lot of the single use um, dryer sheets are not really that effective. So 
brands like True Earth sell them drops or dirty labs. They use different types of uh, strips or pods. So we we'll definitely recommend using that. And then for lint removers, I know so many people who have interviews or trying to get full-time jobs or you're in college of an interview or you're just in class. Um, people spend over $100 million a year globally on lint rollers with paper, right? I actually have one with paper. And I did not know that a plastic-free lint remover exists. Like you can literally reuse this multiple times. And so brands like Escani uh, or generally any zero waste store online sells them. So I definitely recommend trying that out because that is something that I really wanted to try out myself. Um, and then we're gonna go beauty because I think that a lot of people had very interesting questions about it. So the beauty industry has a lot of issues with it, right? There's like um, the mining for Inca, the mineral is very harm children that have to go into these mines and the mines collapse and then kill them or harm them or disable them. Um, it's really awful to see that because it's such a cruel industry and also animals being abused. And so um, there are different ways, especially for anyone who is into beauty, um, is that cosmetics such as like Kajar Waste, they basically are a foundation and blush where they give you everything in a plastic free option where it's like made out of paper. And so you're able to get the refills for each one and then stack them up into your product. And isn't that cool? Cause I was like, that never really existed when I saw it. Um, other things like lipsticks, right? Lipsticks are tested on animals. And so this vegan like cruelty-free zero waste bomb and lipstick like Axology Beauty, it is woman of color owned business. Um, they work with people from different countries, especially women, and hire them and pay them fair wages. And then they produce these plastic free lips. So basically the paper, it's made out of paper. And then basically each time you use it, you can like uh, remove the paper. Uh, they come in different uh, shades and tones. So definitely I recommend anyone who is interested to support this business. And then ear swabs or beauty swabs, like I actually, did was against ear swabs because I was like that's nasty like who would reuse a swab you know because I use cotton swabs and of course some doctors say like don't use swabs um I still use them but I guess I would say that for people um trying to look for reusable beauty swabs or like uh, ear swabs definitely check this one out from last swab because um uh, they're really really cool uh we have a chat sorry drops of hydrogen peroxide clean ears yes yes that is super important. Um, that's another thing way to clean it. I know in some cultures they use like a metal pick, I think, or like with it's heated and they remove it like that. So uh, that's another thing to consider. Um, so with the reusable beauty swab, you get to use that. Um, yeah, so Tupper eco-friendly kitchen, right? So we're trying to live more sustainably as a kitchen. Um, some Tupperware that can be toxic, especially the number three, six, or seven is high risk plastics. And although we grew up with those like Ziploc and like Tupperware, uh, they're very harmful for the environment and your body. So I've used silicone reusable food storage bags. Um, Stasher sells them. And so for me, I, they are dishwasher safe if you have a dishwasher. Um, I didn't grow up with one until like recently in college, but um, definitely do invest in one if you feel that you don't have Tupperware or you need to refill things, um, mainly because these are made of silicone. So although they're not able to be recycled from what I think, I heard that they're compostable, which I don't really know yet, or it hasn't been tested on my end. Um, there's definitely another option for that. With plant-based sponges, a lot of us use those plastic sponges that come from the 99 cent store or like the kitchen stores where they're all plastic. This is a woman of color owned brand too named Squishful that's based in Northern California. And they make plant-based sponges. So basically it's really cool. It's like the, the loofah, right? A lot of people in different countries use loofah. Um, this, what it does is basically you put it in water and then it expands on you, which is really cool because it's like flat. So um, it's purely plant-based and it can be, I think, composted properly through an industry or a backyard. Um, I thought that was a really genius idea because so many of us really use plastic sponges that can be harmful. So definitely look into that. And then unpaper towels. So I don't know if anyone grew up here um, using cloths or like um, 
handkerchiefs, handkerchiefs like for cleaning themselves up. So um, Paper Towels by Marley's Monster is really great too. They um, have like these like wooden things that you're able to basically like have the hook here and then like the paper. And then you just basically each time you reuse it, um, each towel you just put in the laundry and then it's done. And that's something that I would reuse, not the unpapered toilet paper that exists, but the towels I'm more willing to uh, definitely reuse on that end. Um, skincare. So some people ask me about what skincare products work for them. And I'm honestly not a guru, uh, like a skin guru or like know the best things, but I will recommend that um, for anyone trying to invest in just very easy options, um, I use a facial bar. So it's called a rose charcoal. And for me, it's really worked. I use it when I shower. Um, these come especially uh, plastic free. They're not in plastic bottles and brands like Brooklyn Made Natural and the Meow Meow Tweet um, sell them with sunscreen, like mostly sunscreen comes in plastic bottle packaging and things like that. Um, so this one comes in like a, like a basically a tin can where you are able to like use it, which is really cool. And then aluminum containers to refill services. So this is a really awesome company called Plain Products. They sell also shampoo and conditioner in metal, metal containers. And basically you're able to recycle the bottles properly or you can get them refilled by their services. So every time they, you send them back to the company, they sanitize the bottle or they give you a new one and they send it over. So um, definitely if you're looking for like vegan or like eco-friendly brands for like that, I definitely do recommend Plain Products as I've met some of the owners from these businesses. Um, as an office or a student, um, I don't know. I guess sometimes I don't really think about school supplies. I just get what I need, you know, the, every year. Um, factories that make pencils, right, pollute the environment, not in the large aspect, but they do. And so there are plantable pencils that exist where you're able to plant, like each plant has a different type of seed in it. So some of it has tomatoes or lettuce and other celery. Um, Sprout World sells it. And then with paper tape, um, there's like a, instead of using plastic tape, right, we can use paper tape that is also able to be mailed. So if you ever have a package, you're able to use paper tape as one of them. Um, they're really cheap actually too. The brand Craft Tape sells them. Uh, I do really recommend checking that out. And then with paper binders and agendas, if you're, if you're, very, if you're really into being a zero waste student, definitely check out Wisdom Supply Co because they sell a lot of plastic free things. They have sell like plastic free pens, pencils, binders, agendas, paper. It's really interesting to see how they do it. So I definitely recommend that one. And then, yeah, I guess like since we're like a little bit over time on that sense, I did want to say that eco-friendly living is so different for everyone. And it's always best to start at one step at a time. You don't need to buy your way into sustainability, uh, but you have the option to swap out products whenever you like. And so I just want to say thanks everyone. You can connect with me at Career Brown Vegan online, or you can email me. Um, and I did want to take any open q and A. It doesn't have to be eco-friendly living related to. So do let me know if you have any types of questions. All right, thank you, Isaias, yes, that was great. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge on this amazing topic. We will now start the Q&A. So if any of you guys have any questions, um, you can go in the chat um, and ask away. In the meanwhile, we do have a few questions to ask you. Um, so one of the questions we do have for you, Lisa, yes, is how do you identify brands that are truly sustainable from those that are only greenwashing? Can you repeat that again? Sorry. Yeah. Um, how do you identify brands that are truly sustainable from those that are only greenwashing? Um, I think it's really hard to tell. I think small businesses are more likely to be sustainable than large businesses because it's really unsustainable for brands like H&M to be like, oh, we're sustainable. And it's like, no, you're not. You're like fast fashion or forever 21. It's like the clothes are cheaply made and the workers are get, getting paid nothing. And so I think I've met small owned businesses in my areas and actually connect with them. And you'll see that the clothing charges more. So the thing is that with sustainable products or like sustainable businesses is that People are like, oh, it costs too much. I can't afford it. But in reality, we've been really, econo we've, 
we've been normalized to buy cheap products. Like we've been normalized to say, it's okay for us to spend three bucks on a plastic shampoo bottle. Who cares who makes it? Who cares where it goes? Because that's how we kind of live in this society. But unfortunately, a lot of us that grow up low income, it's just like, that's what we have. So I think for me, I kind of identify them as like, um, if they have logos sometimes like B Corp, vegan or things like that. But also too, is like, what are the ethics? Like if you're able to find information of where their workers get paid, like, are they paying fair, fair wages? Um, it's super important. Also, when you Google them being like, is this brand sustainable? Because then you find out so much like shady things about them and you're like, oh my God, like definitely it's a huge issue. So I think for me, it's about personalizing small owned businesses that are trying to enter this industry, especially black indigenous people of color owned. Um, I'm always supporting them, but also, yeah, like be very critical when you ask questions because they're more open to answer your questions. Or if you tag them on Instagram, be like, are you sustainable? And then they'll be like, we're working on it or something like that. Okay, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, and then another question we have is, um, what are the ups and downs when it comes to living on a budget while trying to be sustainable? I think you have to like improvise a lot of things when you're trying to live on a budget, right? I think when I, I remember when I was in college, like someone was like, oh, buy a metal straw. And I was like, what? Like, no, like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm, I don't have money. Like spending $4 was a lot for me for a product or five, but buying a meal with my friends that was like 18 bucks, 19 bucks, or like 14 bucks, like that was fine for me. Cause that was, that was food I wanted to eat. But I think that when we kind of like trying to live on a budget, don't stress yourself out about finding, like look into Facebook marketplaces to see if they sell items that are reused. Like literally there's there's apps like OfferUp or like Depop that exist that you can buy things that are slightly used and better for yourself. So I wouldn't say to people to say that like, um, it's impossible to do it. You just have to be smarter about it. But at the same time, it does require time because as students, we're so stressed out trying to pass our classes that we kind of forget to take care of ourselves. And so definitely don't um, take the time if this is your passion to do it. But if you're not really wanting to do it right now, you're like, I want to do it after I graduate, then that's okay too. Um, I did that too when I, you know, when I went vegan, I was like, oh, I don't want to go because I'm, I said I was too stressed and I'm too tired, but there's a lot of things going on in my life. And so I did a lot of things after post-grad because I felt like I was more controlled of my life. I wasn't dealing with like college BS. So that was some of the things that I did really like. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, another question we have is, what is a persuasive point when someone's point of view is that single use plastic is just way easier and cheaper? Single use, single use plastic is only single use if you determine it to be single use, which means that like you get to decide if it's single use because no one is telling you, oh, throw that away. No, no one really is saying that. But I think as consumers, we've kind of grown up of like, oh yeah, I like throw it away after you're done. And so I think that combating that type of consumption is super important in ourselves, but not to shame ourselves. Like don't shame people if like they're throwing it away. You're just like, well, I mean, who's gonna reuse it, right? So I think that single use like products should be redesigned to be multi-use such as like making them to stainless steel, having incentives for like, you know, college students who bring the reusable cup for coffee, like we'll give you 10 cents off. Like we, there needs to be incentives like that to exist. And so I think that single use has become such an issue for our society, especially in the last 30 years since it, or 40 years since it, it's 40, I think 40 or 50 years of its existence. So yeah. All right, thank you. And then I think we have time for one more question. Um, sorry. Um, okay, so to someone wanting to start living sustainably, what do you recommend as the first step to do? Mm. Write down what you've done that is sustainable because I'll use this as an example. Like my mom and my dad growing up were, were always got angry with me if like I left food outside. You know, like when I... When, when even if it was some ugly Tupperware, they'd be like, put it in there now. 
And so I think that looking at like your lived experiences, like even if you don't have a good relationship with your parents or maybe your siblings or even your love, your partner, like ask them, like, what do they do to be more sustainable? Because there's like, you know how certain people get annoyed when like you litter on the street or they're like, pick it up, you know? Um, I think for us, like we have like these sustainable practices that we don't know. And I think that the thing is that like a lot of people are like, I don't know where to start, but in reality, we know where to start. We look back at our culture and our values. Like that is the number one thing that I tell people is to look back at your lived experiences or your culture, because you'll find out that um, it's hella sustainable and it doesn't have to look, it doesn't have to look pretty. Like it doesn't have to look like a white photo that is aesthetic with the product. Like you need to delete that image out of your head and look and say how it looks to you because that's where I feel like messed me up in college where I was like oh what, do, what does it look like what does it look like but it's like it can look like anything like I know I have a reusable water bottle and it's like I don't think about that now but for some people they're like wow I didn't know I could do that so those are some things I recommend. Uh, thank you. Um, I know in the chat Christina shared um, a website for more sustainable brands um, but if there are no other questions, I think we can end it off here. Uh, thank you so much once again, Isa, yes. I don't know if you have any last words, but we do appreciate you and um, all your great work. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much again, everyone, for having me. If you do have any questions, like, feel free to ask. I'm really open. It doesn't have to be about eco-friendly living either. Um, but thank you so much again for everyone for coming. I really appreciate everyone here. Um, but yes, please keep in contact if you have any questions and also do you follow my page as I kind of discuss these topics more deeper in my page. So if you love um, that, yes. And I do have a website at curbroundvegan.com. Um, primarily, I do talk more about education on there. So there is limited content that kind of talks about like how to live eco-friendly. But uh, if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>